Hey there, and welcome back to Cinema Recap. Today, we're going to be checking out that 2013 American comedy drama called Delivery Man. The movie centers around David, whose life totally changes when he finds out he's fathered over 500 children due to anonymous donations at a fertility clinic. Spoilers ahead. We start off with David, who works at his family's butcher shop. As he's clocking into work in the morning, his brother Alexi is on the phone talking to his very pregnant wife and tells David never to have kids. David tells his brother that he started growing weed in his room to pay back an $80,000 loan. And Alexi can't help but be frustrated with David for not having his life together. 80,000? So David goes on to several banks to ask for another loan to pay back his overdue one, and they're all rejecting him. He goes about the rest of his chores for the day, like getting team jerseys for his father, who happens to be his boss, and purchasing a few gardening books, all while racking up several parking violations on the butcher shop truck, which he isn't supposed to be driving for personal reasons anyway. And by the time night rolls around, the truck gets towed and David ends up disappointing his father yet again. So he meets up with his girlfriend, Emma, apologizing for his recent absence. When Emma tells David that she's pregnant, David's undeterred and wants to be part of the child's life, but Emma dismisses him as too unreliable for the job. Like Alexi, Emma's mad at David for not doing enough with his life, instead of allowing it to slip by without a purpose. Now later that night, David heads over to his friend Brett's house to discuss Emma's recent revelation. Brett's a divorced father, and while David's confident that he wants children, Brett plainly states that David isn't ready for how difficult parenting is. Seems that David really can't catch a break, with all his friends and family nagging him to grow up and do something with his life. All the while, Brett's three kids are running around pestering him while they're trying to talk, as if in support of Brett's side of the argument. I think I might want a kid. And when David gets back to his apartment that night, he finds a man in a suit named Mark Williams sitting in his kitchen. David, assuming he's there to pester him for money, pretends he can only speak Spanish. But that doesn't convince Mark. Mark explains that he's an attorney for the Kabrowski Levitt Clinic, where 20 years ago, David used to anonymously donate sperm quite regularly under the alias of Starbuck. Turns out David's donations helped to sire over 500 children and 142 of them are requesting to know his identity. While legally the clinic is obligated to protect David's identity, the children are contesting it in court because they feel they are entitled to information about their biological father. Yo no soy David Wozniak! So the next day, David meets Brett at a coffee shop. Brett used to practice law, and so he pours over the details and documents of their current predicament excitedly, explaining that he'll call the Bar Association later to reactivate his license. David, however, doesn't really share that excitement. All he knows is that he needs a lawyer, and Brett's services are all he can afford right now. Along with the news of the case, Mark has given David a folder, curated by all 142 of his children. Inside is a profile on each child, who they are, where they live, and what they do. Brett tells him not to open it, but David does so anyway, and picks out one page at random to read. And when he sees the name on the file, he's shocked and calls up Brent to tell him the news. Still driving the butcher shop's meat delivery truck, Brett and David head out to meet the kid from the file, Andrew Johansson. They head to a basketball stadium, and we find out that Andrew is a very famous professional basketball player. David's cheering Andrew from the stands, unable to believe that such an accomplished person came from his genes. Meanwhile, Brett's rifling through the possible defenses for David's case, such as pleading insanity. I don't have mental problems. Then David meets Emma at her job as a police officer. He tells her that he's committed to turning his life around and bikes away awkwardly. Emma, annoyed that he interrupted her during work, looks unconvinced. So back at the butcher shop, Alexi complains about his lack of sleep dealing with his newborn baby, but at the same time he can't help but gush about how much he loves it. David tells Alexi and his father that his girlfriend is pregnant, and they congratulate him, although they didn't even know he had a girlfriend. And that night, David can't help but pull another page from the children's folder. This one's not a basketball player, but a barista named Josh. So he heads over to Josh's workplace to meet him, but they don't have the best exchange. Josh is all upset because he's missing out on a big acting audition, and David inadvertently lectures him the way a father might, which, you know, annoys Josh. So David offers to watch over the coffee shop so that Josh can go audition. 
He doesn't know why David would make such an offer to a complete stranger, but takes it up anyway. I can figure out. David ends up making bad coffee for everyone coming in, while simultaneously getting chewed at by his dad over the phone. And the owner of the coffee shop appears, and when David explains the situation, the owner decides to fire Josh. We find out that Josh is actually a horrible actor that never gets roles at any castings. And so David realizes that he's made a big mistake. Now when Josh comes back, he quickly realizes that he lost his job, but doesn't mind because, believe it or not, he actually got the part. David's ecstatic that he helped Josh, and so back at his apartment, he pulls out another profile. He ends up at the apartment of a young woman, whilst pretending to be a pizza delivery man, and she's screaming on the phone and crying about being owed money. David awkwardly explains that the pizza's free, and the girl just tells him to leave her apartment. When he peers into the bedroom, however, he realizes that she's unconscious from taking drugs and rushes her to the hospital. Now, the girl, whose name is Kristen, is treated, but not allowed to leave the hospital without having a parent sign release papers. Well, Kristen tells the hospital that David's her father, but she doesn't really know it's actually true and tries to get him to sign the papers so she can leave. The doctors, on the other hand, want to sign Kristen up for rehabilitation. But David makes the choice to listen to Kristen and signs the release papers, allowing her to leave, but isn't sure if it is the right decision. She needs to stop using. He stays up all night and in the morning waits outside her job to make sure she gets there on time. And when he sees her head in, he's ecstatic, once again having made the right call to trust his kid and not the other adults in their lives. David ends up throwing away all the weed growing in his apartment. Instead, he sticks all the profiles up on his wall and makes it a point to meet all of them and help as much as he can. He doesn't tell them who he is, but tries to be a positive influence for them wherever possible, almost like a guardian angel. Okay, one of his biological kids is a street performer, so David makes it a point to be at every one of his performances and hustle other people on the street into tipping that performer. Another kid of his is a swimming coach, and so David goes to swimming lessons and pretends to drown so that the young man has someone to save. It goes on and on, with David slowly getting to know all 142 of the profiles he was given. Despite becoming close acquaintances with his kids, they have no idea who he really is, and David plans to keep it that way. So David tells Brett about his recent activities as a guardian angel of all the children he sired. Brett warns him to stop, but it doesn't look like David has plans to do that anytime soon. And after they talk, David gets into his truck and discovers that Emma is in the passenger seat. She says that she's going to go to the first ultrasound and would like to have him there, stressing that it's just as a friend and nothing else yet, because... She still can't bring herself to fully trust his commitment to her. The ultrasound goes well, but Emma's still uncertain of the role David should play in the life of her and her child. They sit down and talk at a playground, and Emma watches the kids play nervously, afraid that she'll be a bad mother or hate her child. She still doesn't know that David has quite literally hundreds of kids, and is surprised when he gives her a rousing speech on the joys of parenthood. Well, she's pleased after hearing it. So she gives him the title of Father on Probation. Daddy on Probation? Now David heads out to meet another one of his kids, a boy named Ryan, who's living with cerebral palsy at a disabled home. They don't really speak to each other, as his disability makes it so he can't speak. But David stays and helps throughout the day. The nurses ask who David is to Ryan, but David doesn't answer truthfully, only implying that he's a friend. And then he goes to meet another one of his sons and while following him around, notices that he has multiple partners that don't seem to be aware of each other. This makes him curious, so he follows the boy to a meeting of some sort. And only when he sits down does David realize that the meeting is of all the Starbuck kids coming together to find the identity of their missing father. Well, David tries to get up and leave, as most of the kids in the room know him in some way or the other, but he gets the attention of the panelists, who assume that he wants to ask a question. He clumsily blurts out that in one sense, it's not important who Starbuck is and that the kids should be thankful for having so many brothers and sisters, which causes the audience to clap for him. As he exits the meeting, Kristen spots him and they hug. David lies and tells her that he's Ryan's adoptive father and is here because Ryan can't make it due to his disability. He rushes out and finds Brett, who was in the meeting to do reconnaissance work for their upcoming case. Brett's urging David to stop meeting with all the kids as it could foil the lawsuit that they're working on, but David doesn't seem to listen. 
So on his way home, he gets accosted by the loan sharks that he owes money to. They rough him up by repeatedly drowning him in his bathtub and leave him afterwards. David tries to call up his friends and family to borrow cash from, but is consistently rejected. Uh, don't worry, man. I understand. He leaves his bedroom to go to the living room and finds a young man standing there. The man introduces himself as Vigo, one of David's biological sons, who noticed David in the meeting today and deduced that he is the father. Now, Vigo asks if he could stay for a few days, and David's forced to comply because otherwise Vigo could potentially expose him to the other kids. Now David takes Vigo to one of his family basketball games. Vigo is embarrassingly bad at it, but enjoys himself. Afterwards, they get some ice cream, and David accidentally implies that Vigo and the kids aren't his real family, which upsets Vigo. But to make it up to him, David attends the next Starbucks kids meeting. It's in a campground by the lake, and they spend the day doing fun group activities and bonding, with all the kids assuming that David is Ryan's adoptive father. And as the sun sets, David wheels Ryan around to meet everyone. When they get back to the disabled home, David whispers in Ryan's ear that he is his biological father, and thus will always be around to keep him company. Emma's invited to meet David's father and siblings for dinner. They have a good time, and we find out that the money David made at the sperm bank was used to take his whole family on a trip to Venice after his mother fell ill. So with the weekend over, David goes over to Brett's house and finds that the Starbuck Kids reunion has made the front page of the paper. Not only that, but it's been covered by multiple news outlets. Also, which means that millions of people now know about the lawsuit. Now, Brett thinks that this may help out their case if they countersue the clinic which may make enough money to cover David's loans, but David rejects the idea. The drama builds up as more and more people learn the story. David asks Emma what she thinks of Starbuck as they're shopping for baby strollers, and she rips into Starbuck, unaware that it's really David. I have 533 children, it's not normal. Now, meanwhile, the loan sharks have made a visit to David's workplace and threatened his family. They nearly drowned his father, his brother urges him to get the cash and repay the loan sharks by any means necessary. David, with not a lot of options, gets over to Brett's place and agrees to the countersuit. Brett practices the speech to his children, while David takes the profiles of his kids down from the wall. The kids are mocking Brett for his weak argument and promptly get put to bed. Why don't I understand when you are talking? Now the first court hearing gains international coverage and pressure builds as David fumbles through his arguments. The opposing lawyers argue that intentionally blocking Starbucks' identity has negatively affected the children and will continue to do so. And the judge seems to agree with this statement. David argues that without the anonymity clause, none of the children would even be in the room. The court moves to take the matter under advisement. The court will now take the matter under advisement. The two are talking in the rain outside while they wait for the verdict. Brett admits that he's a horrible lawyer, and maybe David should have gotten a real proper lawyer to help in this case. So back at the court, the judge returns with a final verdict. Starbuck is entitled to complete and total anonymity, as well as $200,000 in punitive damages. Yes! The press interviews Brett after his victory, and Brett accidentally thanks David on live television. When the press asks Brett who David is, Brett realizes his mistake, and he quickly makes up a lie, telling him that David is the name of his secret lover, and they move on without realizing the truth. However, the Starbuck kids are disappointed, but are still hoping that Starbuck reveals himself, even though he isn't legally obligated to. Now, Later at their favorite diner, instead of celebrating their victory, both Brett and David look dismayed. Brett tells him that if he reveals himself, he'll lose all the money he won in the counter sue. David really wants to do the right thing, but finds that's a lot harder than he thought it was. So David decides to tell his father that he's Starbuck. His father's not angry, but rather amused, and tells his son the story of how he grew up in poverty. You see, David's father tells him how his own father, David's paternal grandfather, loaned him $10 back then, and that's all he had to start a business with. David's father promised to pay back once he made his money, but he didn't get the chance to because he died while David's parents were still penniless. He says he always wondered what was more difficult for his own father, not being paid back the money or not being able to see his family in his final hours. Then David's dad hands him a stack of dollars. 
which is his inheritance and the share of the meat shop. With his father's blessing, David goes home and writes a post on Facebook that reveals his identity as Starbuck. It gets shared around, and then he heads to Emma's house to share the news with her when he sees an ambulance at her doorstep. Turned out that Emma's son was born prematurely, but other than that is healthy and perfectly fine. So David wakes up at the hospital and is visited by not just his brothers and father, but all of his biological children. He tells them about their new little brother. And so they ask to see him, but David still hasn't broken the news to Emma that he's Starbuck. David asks Emma to marry him, and after she agrees, I'm Starbuck. Then he tells her he's Starbuck. Well, she panics, but he explains that it's wonderful, and they'll get a ton of free babysitting. After some convincing, she eventually accepts it, and all the kids come together to meet Emma's newborn baby. And that's how that one ended. Wow. Could you imagine having like 500 brothers and sisters? Why don't you let us know your thoughts in the comments below with that hashtag cinema recap. Till next time.